Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us today, uh, myself and Connie and Jacob, and for those of you who have been tuning in every week, and I know there's a, a lot of you who have been, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, uh, what we wanna talk about is uh, we wanna spend some time talking about uh, business resilience. And uh, we've been running this webinar now, I think this is the 13th or 14th episode, so that's pretty cool. And the idea has been to talk with uh, business owners, to talk to entrepreneurs, uh, to talk to people who have online and offline businesses about uh, business resilience, right? And, and uh, I think um, one of the elements of business resilience is also mental health. It, it's tough to run a business uh, at the best of times. You know, yesterday uh, in another webinar I was on, we interviewed uh, George Brookman, who's been in uh, Calgary, the business world here uh, for 50 years. And, uh, and he said this is the toughest uh, he has ever seen it. And, uh, and, and that actually really spoke to me because, you know, in, in, in normal times, running a business is hard and you need your mental health. Uh, how much more uh, in a time like COVID-19? Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, COVID-19 has impacted us in a profound way. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time today. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing Connie Jacob and I'm going to introduce her in a moment. But to uh, set up the conversation today, uh, you know, we are, we do want to talk about kind of mental health after COVID in the context of sort of business resilience. Uh, COVID-19 has, I think, totally changed the world, uh, but it's also changed the mental health of our world. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the research is yet to be done, but we're going to start to see this emerge in time about the long-term mental health impacts of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at COVID-19 and mental health today and uh, how we can support people. But here's the reality, trauma impacts us, right? Uh, traumatic events from, uh, I mean, you name it, from uh, wars to natural disasters to, uh, you know, crises economically, these things can damage people's mental health. And I think COVID-19, it's absolutely no different. I mean, we've seen stories of doctors and nurses who have committed suicide, if you can imagine, through COVID-19. Uh, in Germany, a state minister of finance ended his own life. I mean, that is wild, you know, when you think about it. Uh, we've heard lots of reports of domestic violence on the rise, and that's a tragedy any day of the week, but especially in this time. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there's been a lot of research out there about the fact that quarantines and lockdowns uh, are traumatic, you know, just you not being able to take a walk, you uh, not being able to go outside and wonder, is somebody going to breathe on me, these droplets that are apparently infected? I mean, this is actually traumatic. I, you know, you go down to Costco and it's like a war zone sometimes, you know, people <laughs> all, all layered up, right? Preparing uh, for, the, for, for, for what appears to be some sort of biohazard uh, that could kill you on the spot. And, and of course, uh, hey, people need to do what they need to do for their own safety. That is totally okay. Uh, so whatever you need to do, you need to do. Uh, but there's no doubt that all of this has a major impact on people's mental health. And, you know, here's what really breaks my heart is, as a dad, as a parent, as a, a human, as a member of sort of the global society that uh, post-traumatic stress scores are four times higher in children who have been isolated. And I think we're, we're seeing uh, impact on our children. Um, children are incredibly resilient, but I think we're gonna look back on 2020 as, as a major traumatic event in the development of a lot of children's brain uh, because children need to play to have healthy brain development and they don't just need to play with Lego and they don't just need to play with, uh, you know, the, the internet or the smartphone. They need to play with each other. They need, they need touch. They need interaction. They need affection. They need all of those things. And uh, I think that that's um, a, a real challenge. And, and, you know, in a recent poll, uh, about 45% of adults in the U S reported that their mental health has been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over the virus. And in Canada, the numbers are higher. And, uh, and, and so experts are really starting to say that the real second wave is going to be a mental health pandemic. And, uh, and you're like, well, how do you know? Well, you know, uh, we work in mental health for one thing. <laughs> so that's a good indicator. Uh, but beyond that, you know, calls to some suicide hotlines are, are reporting uh, increases of 80 times uh, during this pandemic. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, 
40 million jobs have been lost in the US. Uh, in Canada, 4 million, 4 million jobs. I mean, just think about that for a moment, right? Add up, you know, Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton. Every person in all of those uh, folk in, the, in, in those cities, and that's the equivalent of what's happened. And 7 million have applied for uh, CERB, which tells you that the, the real numbers are, are higher. You know, a lot of folks who have gig economy jobs, people who are doing side hustles and side businesses, they're not technically employed but their income has plummeted. And so of course they've applied for this emergency benefit uh, and hundreds of thousands across uh, uh, of North America, hundreds of thousands of businesses have closed their doors and many will never reopen. Now I've, I've actually talked to people and this is crazy, I'm gonna get to Connie in a moment, but they said, well, who cares, right? It's, it's the economy, uh, you know, what we need to care about people's health. And, um, and, and, and hey, uh, yeah, we do. Um, but you know that trauma is actually in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you might be sitting fine because maybe your situation is great and life's been good to you or God's been good to you or the universe has been good to you. But imagine being a small business owner and sinking every penny that you've got into your little restaurant or your hair salon. And then COVID comes along and wipes it all out. You know, and, and we've all heard this, but it's absolutely true that we might all be in the same storm. But guess what? We ain't all in the same boat. I mean, as, as COVID-19 has hit all of us, absolutely, uh, people are experiencing COVID at, at different levels and in different ways. And as the poor are getting poor, and as the middle class are getting poorer, uh, you know, the richest are getting wealthier. And, and to me, that's a problem because uh, I guarantee you, uh, they're not taking that $255 billion you can see on the screen and redistributing it to the neediest and, the, and, and the, the, the ones who are hurting the most. I think in a lot of ways, probably the opposite is happening. And so what's the solution? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think the solution is always in conversations. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we have a limited ability, uh, any one of us, to make change. But collectively, we can do so much. And, uh, and so today, I'm, I'm so excited to uh, have Connie Jacob with us. Uh, Connie is uh, a, a good friend, um, but also she is a person who's been uh, knee deep in uh, in sort of mental health, and I'm going to say actually neck deep, <laughs> you know, just up to your knees isn't too far, uh, but but up to your neck I think uh, would describe Connie uh, for for over two decades, uh, and, and Connie's worked in this space and and worked at it from a number of different levels. Um, uh, she's also been uh, a partner of mine in Wellness Innovate, where we've been working together uh, with businesses and seeing firsthand uh, the impact on people's mental health. And, and you know, yesterday we ran a conference and, and I've, I've already gotten messages from people saying that, well, some of the presenters were presenting on mental health through COVID. People were in tears. And I mean, these are folks who work for government offices sending me messages about how stressed they felt and how under anxiety and, and how difficult it's been. And to know that, that uh, just putting on a webinar uh, could impact people so that they have the courage and the strength to get through another day. I mean, that's the kind of thing that Connie does uh, eight days a week. And so, uh, Connie, welcome. I'm so grateful to have you here today. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> so tell us uh, a little bit about how you got into the field of mental health, because you got into mental health uh, before it was sort of like the cool thing to do, right? So you've been at this for a long time. So tell us how you got there. Yeah, you know, uh, justice has always been a real passion of mine. Social justice, looking around, seeing what are the needs. Um, started my, my work in East Vancouver, really just <laughs> not having many skills at all. Just looking around, seeing the youth and wondering, how are we going to help these kids who are on the street? How are we going to help the ones that are um, in addiction, selling drugs, the gang members back then? That was a real problem. And I've always been one to look at what can we do? And I didn't have much training at that time. I didn't have, I had a, a college degree. That's all I had. I had no uh, book smarts, uh, had no street smarts, that's for sure. And honestly, um, I took a hip hop class and I just started right there. And I know some people think, well, that's really not applicable to me at all. But I always, I always say to people, what do you see and what's in your hand? And so I was seeing things and my, my hip hop was a way to relate to these kids. And so that's where it started. It started on the streets of East Vancouver. 
and have just been diving in full force ever since. I just love that, Connie. And um, I just love that uh, approach, you know, I mean, hip hop, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person who has failed miserably at hip hop, but uh, my heart has always been there. And uh, like a, a lot of white guys, I kind of have a little bit of shoulder movement, but I'll tell you what, the hips don't lie and the hips are not working for this guy very well at all. Uh, but I love your attitude. And that is, you know, take what's in your hand and use it to make a difference. So tell us, you know, in the middle of COVID and, and you've been working, I know we've been working closely together. And then I know you do a whole bunch of other things uh, around parenting, which is just unbelievably awesome. And I know you're a resource to parents uh, all over the world. And so tell us, what are some of the things you're noticing? And I'll just let you talk freely, whether you want to go into the parenting space or the business space, just, just kind of speak from the heart here. Well, you know, it's so interesting because uh, in the parenting space, in the business space, I feel like we're talking about the exact same things. And so it's really quite easy to see how much they overlap. Um, it's, it's actually been really painful, to be honest. Um, it's been painful to watch people and, and just to see what they're going through. Um, I had posted on my Facebook wall uh, about the conference we did yesterday. And I just asked business owners, so like, can you tell me what's going on in your world? I mean, I've been watching, Abe, you've been watching, we've been really trying to uh, work from the ground up. So a lot of times, you know, companies come in and they have their solutions, but they're not on the ground. And what I've really appreciated about you, Abe, and, and about what we're doing is that we're on the ground and we're listening and we're, we're getting into hard conversations and, and people value that. Uh, they don't want to be treated as tools and strategies to be solved. They, they need to know, does somebody see me right now? Does someone understand me? And um, I, I'll just read you a couple of statements that people said on my Facebook wall. Uh, one person said, they have zero downtime to the point of exhaustion. And that is a reality for so many right now. Like we are, we're working, we're at home. I mean, I'm looking at my dishes right now that need to be cleaned. I mean, who's going to clean my dishes? Like my husband is working at our Calgary Dream Center. I don't, we're not home together, which to be honest is probably a saving grace. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's all on me. And so I get that with that person who said zero downtime. Um, one, one friend of mine who just uh, she is one of those that you talked about. She is one of those people who you said she poured her life savings, all of her heart and soul. She built this business four years ago, and she's been so honest on her Facebook about her entrepreneurial journey, how hard it's been. It's not sexy. It's not easy. And she wrote, accepting that I may lose everything that I've worked for and the depression that sunk in because of that. Man, that just gripped my heart because anyone who's ever owned their own business knows how that feels. It's really your baby. You're, you put so much into it and to lose it over something that just kind of came out of nowhere, that is overwhelming. Um, somebody else said, knowing everything I've worked for is out of my control. Being out of control is definitely something we're hearing a lot. The uncertainty. Um, someone said, losing all my staff. Um, even though they remained busy, no one wanted to work. Everyone was afraid. So they all stayed home and she lost all of her staff. And then what does she do? You know, so there's, there's having to pivot so quickly and, and also shift our, our homes at the same time. Um, making sure I took care of all my thoughts and feelings. Uh, this one really gripped me too. Watching 15 years of an established business that was built on integrity, commitment, and trust slowly dwindle down. Um, the, the out of control aspect is weighing heavily. I mean, these people are, this is what people are feeling right now. And maybe you listening, this is, you're identifying with that to some degree, whether you're a business owner, you run an organization, you've had a dream and this has shaken everything. Uh, it, it has been very, very challenging for people. And uh, sometimes I'm not going to lie. It feels like, how do we, how do we help? <laughs> Yeah. And, and again, we just have to start with the, the little bits, the little steps, helping people where we can. Well, and it's funny to me because, you know, like, like, why should we care? You know, like, like, and, and I know that sounds like a terrible question, but, you know, there are some out there and, and I, I get the fact that anytime there's a, an issue, we, we like to go to one extreme or the other because there's some level of safety, you know, because there's this certainty. 
And so, you know, if, if we're safe and we don't have the virus, then who should care about our businesses? And, and why should we care about all this economic loss? And, you know, all these business owners, they'll just pick it up again, won't they? Like, you know, like, like what, what's the right way to sort of handle that? Because yes, I think we do need to care about our physical health. Absolutely. I mean, my goodness, especially uh, those who have immune compromised systems or perhaps maybe elderly. I mean, at all costs, we need to protect people. But, you know, is, is it a fair thing to say that, that your mental health really matters and that if, that if your business uh, sort of collapses, that uh, that can impact your mental health? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, these things affect, um, affect our mental health in huge ways. And often as, as, as human beings, especially living in today's world, in our culture that is all about hustle and go and produce and, and make sure you have really cool big things going on. And when you don't, you feel like you're less than. I mean, that is our culture. And, and we don't realize how much that has been storing up um, our mental health swindling down but that cortisol that that hormone that is constantly being released of stress it actually takes physical uh, manifestation it affects our body and trauma there's a my favorite book on trauma is the body keeps the score and it's all about how our bodies literally store trauma so anyone who says that their physical health is not directly related to their physical health uh, or their mental health is, is, is uh, well, needs to get uh, educated. <laughs> it, it's so important. We don't realize. Um, there's another amazing book by one of my favorite doctors, Gabor Mate, and he wrote a book on literally um, diseases that are directly correlated in our body to stress. And it was a very sobering book, but it's a wake-up call. It's a wake up call to remember that if you don't take care of your mental health, your physical health will suffer. Maybe not right now, but over time it builds. And, and uh, we certainly want people around for the long haul. So what, uh, you know, so then, so that, that makes a lot of sense to me and, and thanks for pointing that out. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, I, 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 I got a call from a, a, a very successful business person a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and she had, had told me that literally um, because of stress, she was, she was shutting down. She was, she was starting to black out. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't see sort of past her computer screen. Everything was blurry. And of course, the first thing I said was, you know, you, you need to go see a doctor because you, you need to make sure that there's not something else going on. But, uh, you know, this is a person who has, uh, has spent a long time in community and has given a lot, uh, not so that she can roll around on a yacht, uh, but so that she can keep people employed and keep people working. And, uh, and so for these business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, people tuning in today, I mean, what can they do to support their mental health? I mean, you're 100% correct. There's so much we can't control right now, you know, and that's, that's a tough thing to accept because most of us like to be in control. Uh, so acknowledging that, you know, you can't wave your hand and make COVID go away. Uh, we do need to continue to obviously follow direction from our health authorities and be uh, good citizens. But, but what are some things that I could do to, to manage my mental health and get myself through this? Well, you know, instantly everyone probably thinks, oh, I should probably do mindful practices or I need to do yoga. <laughs> and I mean, by all means, go for it. <laughs> Not a bad thing, right? Um, but I think we often forget about the idea that, um, uh, I said this yesterday, rest is a business strategy. Um, taking a few steps back, um, I know for me right now, we've been going so hard. I literally this morning felt my brain just say, I can't compute anymore. Like I'm done. And so I thought, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to carve out time to, to just not do anything, to spend some time with my kids, to just, to just be. And We've been given an opportunity in some ways. I mean, it's, we're starting to go back to work, but we really have to evaluate the structure we've created around our lives. And for many of us, it's been an intense season for a long time. It's been build, hustle, go, produce, push. And maybe that's been over 10 years. Maybe it's been five years of intensity. And intense seasons are not good for our mental health. 
they affect us. And when your brain starts to shut down um, and you can't do simple tasks, an email might cause you uh, stress or simple things um, like cleaning your house. If, if there's things you notice that are starting to become hard, that aren't usually hard, it's a huge sign that you need to stop. And, and for many of us, we think I can't stop. I, I wanna challenge that. Um, you are 100% in control of, of your schedule and what you do. And uh, you might think, well, my boss is expecting me to do such and such. Well, I love what Arnold Schwarzenegger said at a, at a conference I was at just before COVID hit. He said, there's 24 hours in a day. And who says that it has to be nine to five? I do my most productive work between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. because mm -hmm. nobody's up. <laughs> After that, everything could kind of go crazy. And I have to schedule my day so that I'm taking care of myself. Um, I need to go to bed early because I get up early. I need to be in bed by 930. I think we don't under, we've underestimated um, how much we have expected our body and our brain to do every day. When you look back a hundred years ago, we take in more information in a day than people did their whole lives. And we do that in a day. Think about what that does to our brain. It's, it's incredible. And so we need to uh, take, take to heart these messages that say, um, it's okay not to be okay, but I'd like to take that a step further because to me, if you just stay there, <laughs> you're going to wallow in, I'm not okay. You need to take some action um, and, and, and take control again over what you can control, which is you and your schedule and what you can handle and understand that capacity um, switches over time. And you might be able to have strong capacity tomorrow, but maybe not today. Listen to it. That's my greatest advice. I love that. I love that. And, and I love the fact that, you know, you've got to respect your body clock, right? And respect your uniqueness. I, I think uh, COVID has created opportunity for that. And I think that some of us may never go back to the traditional office environment, or at least in the way that we did. And maybe that's a good thing. But rather than sort of saying, hey, this has been all bad, I think that there's been some positives in COVID. Very much. I, I think that it's a, uh, br brought us an awakening to patterns that were not healthy for us as a culture. So, you know, uh, and this one's a tough one because, you know, right now, not, not only are we, you know, sort of collectively as, as a society dealing with COVID and, and just, you know, I mean, we're talking like the full meal deal, right? Economic, mental health, physical, all of it. And, um, you know, it's a sensitive one because, you know, of course, I'm not a person of color. Uh, you know, we see what's happening in the United States right now. And, uh, you know, you and I happen to be Canadian, but I, I think we would be um, really foolish to, to imagine that, uh, you know, racism and systemic racism isn't a part of, of uh, Canada as well, our history and our present. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm married to a, a woman from another culture whose skin color is not white, but that has nothing to do with making me an expert. And uh, I, I haven't spoken out on social media a lot about uh, this uh, in the US, the race sort of protests and all of that, because I, I feel like I don't have anything to say. You know, it, it's almost like all I wanna do is cry and, uh, and throw my hands up in the air because I, I can't imagine that anyone, I mean, I, I don't care your skin color, uh, it doesn't matter to me if, if it was an animal. You, you wouldn't put your, your, neck, your, your knee on somebody's neck for, for nine minutes. Uh, you wouldn't do that to a cat. I mean, you, you would not do that to a squirrel. You wouldn't do it to your, your dog. And if you did, you'd get charged and you should. And, and, and what, like, what can we do? I mean, it's, it's such a, a tragedy because, you know, the, the, to me, it's, it's like we, we need to legislate. Absolutely. We need to march. Yep. But, but there's a heart issue here. Like there, there's something wrong with people's empathy. If, if I can put my, my neck on somebody, my knee on somebody's neck, like, like how, you know, and so to the midst, you got COVID, you got all this economic stuff and then all this other stuff. So what are, what are your, what, are you, what can you say? Because I know you've worked with, you know, multiracial communities, very diverse communities throughout your career. So have I. Um, that doesn't mean we get it. But, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, that, it is a hard one. You know, the last uh, theater 
production that I produced was, um, was about who created you. I asked the artist to dive into um, where did you, where, what's your origin? Um, and and the, the show got highly racial um, and it was beautiful. What, what we saw on the stage was Filipinos sharing um, about um, how they were taken over. <laughs> they, they were um, just like our indigenous, they were taken over by the Catholic church. They told their story. Um, we had a black woman share her story. Um, it was powerful. And I feel like nobody, I mean, we're all wanting the same thing. What's really blowing my mind is I scroll through my social media. How many black boxes were there the other day on Tuesday? So many. We all want the exact same thing. How come we can't do it? Um, there are a couple people that Maybe, yeah, ignorance and their, they, the way they, were grew, they grew up, for sure. But I, I think the average human, the average human right now is saying we all want the same thing, which is we want everyone to feel equal, not just be equal. Belonging has to be felt. Everyone has the exact same um, desire. Every single one of us, no matter where we're from, no matter how old we are, everyone wants to be understood. And when we're not understood, we become the worst versions of ourselves and we start fighting for our right to be heard and and what I call an orphan heart just starts pouring out of us you know we forget that we belong we forget we're adopted as children and um, and, and we belong to humanity uh, I, I really think that listening is a really good first step um, to really listen to the stories and and to not butt in and say oh but I'm not like that <laughs> Well, nobody cares if you're like that. It's not about, about our intentions as white people. It's about listening to the stories. And to be honest, mental health, the health of our brain um, is, uh, is, is not created through mindfulness. It's created through community. And so when I, when I see these racial things going on, I actually see it through a mental health practitioner lens, a resilience lens. And I think, you know, really, it really does come to this idea of having a table where everyone is welcome and where everyone feels listened to. And, and here's the thing, whoever feels hurt, um, th that's whose opinion matters. It doesn't matter if we don't think they should feel hurt. Our opinion does not count in that moment. Whoever's hurt, they feel hurt, that's the opinion we listen to in order for someone to feel understood. And there's this interpersonal neurobiology at play we highly affect one another as humans. And so as human beings, um, our story is constantly being imposed on us. So when we grow up, uh, we come into the world, uh, this little baby, and we're constantly having identity spoken over us. You know, what a fat baby, what a cute baby, what a loud baby. And then we become a toddler and people are continuing to tell our story. Um, you know, what a loud one, what a monkey. And then we go to school and we find out who we are. We find out whether we're cool, whether we're not, whether we're a good student, a bad student. People are always speaking our story over us. And for us to rise up and believe anything different, to be resilient takes an incredible amount of strength that most of us don't have because we're swimming upstream against what people have been telling us our whole lives. So you take someone who has been um, discriminated against their entire life and you just tell them to get over it. <laughs> They've been hearing this their entire life. It's a part of their identity. They've yeah. taken it on. And, and so the first step is to that reconciliation of listening. And it might take them a couple of years to unload what they're feeling and and what we need to do is just say i am so sorry that happened i'm so sorry i'm listening i'm here tell me more and eventually healing will come but uh that those neurons those wires that have fired together that believe i don't belong i'm not worthy i am living this way i am oppressed i am whatever the only way that's going to heal is through listening and then we rewire the brain um, when people feel heard, understood, and like they belong without any kind of barriers at all. Yeah. No, and I, I really, I love hearing you say that. And, and there's just so much, uh, so much wealth in what you said. And, you know, I, I think for us who are sort of, you know, um, obviously white folks who are, are here, you know, I, I mean, 
for for whatever it's worth, we we just want uh, all sort of racialized uh, and 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 uh, sort of folks who have been excluded to know that we are here to support and here not only to support but to fight with you and fight for you. Uh, you know, it, it's it's actually uh, so evil, and it's such a heartbreak to see that. And uh, you know, I, I you know you, you you know in times like this, I I've been leaning a lot on the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, because I, I, I think, you know, he was a person who, who got it a heck of a lot better than I got it. And I haven't been posting much of my own beyond just uh, some quotes from him. And, and one of the things he said was, you know, you, essentially you can't fight hate with more hate. Um, you know, you, you can't replace darkness with, with more darkness. And it, and it makes sense, you know. Uh, and, and so I think, yeah, we need to pray and hope that we have a strong response, an unrelenting response um, and, and, and yet um, a loving response so that we can uh, hopefully change uh, this world from the inside out. So, you know, so a comment in the chat window here. Uh, these webinars are helping me stay sane. Thanks for that, Andrea. Um, uh, for as much as I'm not a business owner right now, I fully support small businesses and have connections to many. Thanks for that. And I hope you know that uh, you guys have had an impact on reassuring people that, that, that there's hope and goodness in humanity. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, so Connie, um, you know, parenting, I mean, parenting through, through a pandemic, uh, you know, talk to us about that. I mean, I'm a parent, I have three kids, but uh, two of them uh, are too old to live with me or, you know, they're on their own. And one is uh, with us and uh, she's five, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on parenting through this pandemic. Oh, well, what a task this has been, hey? <laughs> Who signed up for this? Um, you know, honestly, even this morning, my, my little guy, he looked at me and he said, what are we doing today? And I said, well, you know, I have to work till about four. And he's like, oh, you have to work every day. I'm like, well, yes, <laughs> that is the way that the adult world works. And it was cute. Before COVID, he had been begging me to homeschool him. And now he's realizing, I do not want to be homeschooled. That's this right. is awful. <laughs> One you know? way to cure them, right, of that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, and I've been hearing from parents, you know, it is. It's just been such a struggle to balance work and home. And then this homeschooling thing. I don't know. I've put my hands up and I've surrendered. I, I've got nothing, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it, it really is what it is. It's June. I want to give all the parents out there some hope. Um, one of the coaches that works with me, um, in my Brave Parent Institute. I'm not the only one that does that. I have coaches that work with me because I'm <laughs> not that great on my own. But so I bring in people with strengths. And one of the coaches is a school principal. And she's telling parents, don't worry about academics right now. Don't even worry about it. June is, is a time when, when we're winding down and we're doing lots of fillers just to make it through the month. Um, don't worry about it. And so I'm taking her up on that and I'm not worrying about it because it is the one thing that I just cannot do right now. And I've homeschooled before. I have homeschooled my oldest. Um, I, I would say that I'm a, a bit of a homeschool veteran and this is different. This is not homeschooling. This is pandemic schooling. This is different. Um, Childcare, having to balance. I would say to parents, that our number one thing that we need to focus on right now is our own emotional regulation. That is the number one thing. When parents say, what, what should I be doing? Do whatever it takes to, to create the environment in your home for emotional regulation. Because our kids, they, their world has been shaken. They, they, they can't see their friends. Playgrounds were closed. That was hard. Some parents with autism, uh, with kids with autism, couldn't even go for walks because they're, um, depending on where they were in the spectrum, the kids would see the playground and not understand the fact that it's closed and they would have a massive fit. And then you have other parents who've struggled with um, kids with high needs or um, severe mental health concerns such as violence. I know one parent, her son pushed her down the stairs because their in-house supports are gone. These are real things that parents are facing. And it, it actually scares me to think that these parents are having to do it on their own. And then who do you tell? Who do you tell when your house is suffering? That's why domestic violence is going up. That's why abuse is going up. Because parents, nobody wakes up wanting to hurt anyone. 
but we, we become so emotionally dysregulated ourselves because of everything that's going on. We just can't take it that we lash and then we feel awful and we don't tell a soul because God knows nobody else goes through this. And that's the huge, that's the biggest lie. Everyone right now in their home has probably had at least one argument today. Hands up, anyone? <laughs> at least one. <laughs> or at least some kind of, you know, you're living together with your family. And so it's so important to keep your own mental sane, sanity in, in check. And that's why we can't do too much right now. We have to know our constraints, know our limitations. Don't push too hard because you'll push yourself over the edge and you'll have nothing left for your home. And right now, with our kids being home, this is the greatest opportunity for them. If they were struggling with any kind of social anxiety, anxiety, depression, home can actually bring them out of that. Um, they're not around their peers. They're not in school. They're not feeling that pressure. This is a huge opportunity for mental well-being to come back to our kids. But that does come back right on us, which I think is such a gift because we've often thought, send my kid to the counselor, put them on meds, the school can deal with them. We've been sending them everywhere else but with us. And I have to say, parents, the buck stops here. You are the parent, I am the parent. We are responsible for these kids. We are the ones who write their future. Yeah. And now we get to. Absolutely. And, and are we seeing any indications of, of kids experiencing some trauma through this and the amount of isolation? What, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what are you seeing? Oh. Yeah, I mean, just just the sadness, even just my son this morning, you know, missing his friends and, and we've had a cohort family for both of our kids through this. So um, some kids have been completely isolated. But um, when Dr. Hinshaw said that we were allowed to have one cohort family, we won't see anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, both my boys have that. And even with having a friend that they see once a week, it's still been challenging. It's so different. And honestly, I'm really watching right now. I'm watching my little guy, especially, who needs people. My oldest doesn't like people. So this is great for him. He's fine. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm watching him and I'm watching his moods and that Eeyore mood, that Eeyore mood of just like numb, not wanting to do anything. If your kid doesn't want to do school right now, it's because they're so numb. And that's a sign. Behavior is communication. Behavior tells a story. They're not lazy right now. They're not, um, they're, if they're talking back, they're telling you a story that I don't know how to handle this. And so my behavior is the only thing I can do to show you something's wrong. I don't feel right here. That's just uh, so powerful. Uh, thanks for sharing that, uh, Connie. And, and uh, what are some, some tips, uh, you know, to help parents get through the summer, right? Because you, you know, now, now that we sort of shut schools down in March, you know, like your principal coach was saying, you know, it's, it's sort of June and then you still got to get through July and August and, and, you know, we're still probably dealing with travel restrictions potentially. And, you know, so, so what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? I can't, I, that goes through my mind. <laughs> <laughs> what is summer going to look like? Um, I do think that, uh, we are we are planning um, little outings, ways okay. to get out of our four walls, hitting, uh, going to the mountains, going places that we are allowed to go to, um, the change of scenery, getting the bikes on on the back of the the vehicle and going somewhere else in Calgary that we've never been, um, taking the opportunity to do things that maybe normally we wouldn't do, um, trying to make sure we do those things, and then. Um, I don't know. I have to talk to my boss, but I was thinking of asking if I could work, uh, you know, half days in the summer so that yeah. in the afternoons we can do things. I know um, we set up a badminton net in our backyard. That's been a real life giving uh, activity for us. I, we just have to be really thinking outside the box right now. Um, and, and, and really being creative with our kids and they understand our, our, our need to work, they do, they get it. Um, I think just making sure we take time every day. I tell parents all the time, you are your child's dope. You're the dopamine fix that they are looking for. 
Um, when parents ask me, how much screen time should my kid have? I'm like, I don't know, put yours down first and see what happens. If you want them to put their screen down, replace it with you. Spend 15 minutes. It's not go big or go home. It's, it's 15 minutes, a little Uno game. It's just something to connect every day. Yeah. And, and you would be surprised what difference that'll make in them. It doesn't have to be the whole day. No, no. And, it, and it's uh, interesting, right? Because that, uh, that social connection is so important. I mean, I love what you're saying. You are your, your kid's dopamine. And yet, uh, as a, a parent, you know, try to also reach out and find some other parents that you can sort of cope with. And, and we know that the health restrictions are, it sounds like being relaxed. And there's still some obvious, uh, obvious distinctions around large groups. And you wouldn't want to have 50 people over to your house. But uh, I know with our daughter, Jasmine, we've been exploring more uh, you know, where we can get together with friends a little bit and, you know, keep it safe and, and keep it uh, uh, where it needs to be. But uh, I, I, as a parent, I feel like the risk to her long-term health of that sort of uh, continued isolation is, is greater. Uh, and that, you know, hey, uh, fault me if you like, but, um, you know, I love my daughter and, and my wife and I are aligned on that. And, and that doesn't mean we're breaking the rules, but but, you know, what I found is that there are some parents out there who kind of feel the same way. And they've said, yeah, we, we want to connect our kids and not go all crazy and share straws and, you know, <laughs> you know, but, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of like, how do you find that balance where you're saying, yeah, we're going to uh, respect. I mean, Dr. Dina Henshaw in our province has been stellar. We've had so many strong health authorities right across Canada, I think, who have done a great job of giving us sort of practical real world guidance. But the other thing I think is the outdoors too, right? I mean, as much as you can, I mean, our, our Canadian summer, like <laughs> there it is and then it's gone. <laughs> so you got to do what you can do, right? To, um, uh, if you can maximize it and we're not all going to be uh, bike riding or whatever, but we can find something I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's nice that playgrounds are open now. It is. Yeah. So, so for, so for business, I mean, COVID, um, you know, what has COVID meant for you in terms of your business and the work that you're doing? Well, it is certainly laser focused. Um, what I do, um, I've never been more clear on what I am passionate about, what, what I, what my contribution is in our culture, in in our world. I feel like I'm living right in my sweet spot, mental health and resilience, being there for business, being there for parents, being there for the adults. Really, it's just holding the adults right now. And I really do believe in the cause that we work for, that if you can change the workplace, you literally can change the world. Um, that is where culture shift is going to happen. And what an opportunity. I mean, COVID hit, and I, I, I don't certainly don't like COVID, but it was like, this is an incredible opportunity in history to shift some things that we have been, we've been preaching all this and now we've had to adjust in the ways that you and I have known our culture has had to adjust for years. And now here we are and we're ready to serve. It's been a, a real pleasure. The, the, the struggle has been the workload could probably never stop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about the idea of focus, and I love how you're saying that because, um, and I, I know some who are watching today, they might have missed our, our online conference called Pivot uh, from yesterday. And, uh, and that's okay. If you missed it, just send myself or Connie a message and uh, we'll get you a copy of the recording. Uh, but Connie, you gave a talk yesterday that really spoke to a lot of people. And what was interesting was how, as you shared your own career progression and and how you've had to pivot and, you know, and, and, and so you didn't find clarity easily, you, you know, like, I guess that would be my observation. Like, it wasn't like you went and signed up for a meditation session and walked in confused and walked out like crystal clear. I mean, you know, talk a little bit about that journey of finding clarity, because how do we, how do we get to that clarity? And what would, what did that look like for you? Oh, you're right. It was, it was many pivots. It was heart, it was heartbreaking experiences, you know, from my, from noticing that hip hop related to youth at risk, I started my first social enterprise business of, of opening a hip hop dance studio. And again, it was my baby. It was my, it was my everything. And then 
My husband told me that we were moving back to Calgary. My, my family had all passed away. It was just my mom. So it, again, tragedy uh, changes our trajectory. And I think I'm going to hold on to this thing. And I thought I'm hiring a manager. And then she gets locked out of the building and calls me up and says, I quit. My business dies in one day. It's gone. Everything I built for. And, and you know, I've been through that valley of, of losing something that is so precious. And you're like, well, now who am I? That was the big realization is that I'd put so much of my identity in what I do, but who I am and who you are stays the same, no matter what job you have or what's taken from you, you're still there. And getting firmly planted on those, on your values and your identity and who you really are is so crucial to being able to pivot quickly through these things. And you'll find, at least I found, and that was just one experience, but one experience after the other of having to quickly pivot. I own this business, now I don't. Uh, now we've started this, now I feel in my gut, oh, I, I need to stop doing that. Well, that doesn't make sense. I, 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 should, that, that, I should keep going. Isn't that what people tell us to do? You know, push through the hard. And yet in my gut, I knew I'm not supposed to push through the hard. Um, I'm getting older. I, 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 kids don't want a 50 year old hip hop teacher. Maybe, I don't know. Like you start, you start um, learning through, through these experiences of loss of things being taken away without your permission or your control. And, and it, it somehow leads you to where you're supposed to be. It just blows my mind. I mean, to me, that has to be God, right? Or somebody's looking out for us because we constantly are, are being directed towards further focus. And I think if we all took a moment and reflected on the experiences of our life that have been the most painful, the most hard, the, the times of loss, what did that do for us? Did that focus us? Absolutely. Are you doing right now what you're doing because of loss and crisis? Maybe. Um, and so it's a huge opportunity to, to uh, come into what you're actually meant to do. I love that. I love that. And, 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 that, and that, you know, it is, it, it is a bit of an evolutionary thing, right? Because when you were doing, you know, the hip hop, that was what you were meant to be doing in that moment. And, and here you are today doing what you're meant to be doing in this moment, right? And, and you have to fully engage in today uh, if you want to sort of get the most out of tomorrow, if that kind of makes sense, right? Um, so the question here from uh, one of the uh, folks in the chat window, uh, and it's, it looks like a parenting question to me, uh, Andrea says, why do we feel guilty when we know in our hearts that we are responsible, but we need to take care of our mental health and the mental health of our kids? Have we become that judgmental in society. So I'd love to hear you answer that. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea, for throwing me an awesome curveball. No, uh, I think that to be human is to feel guilty all the time. I think when we, when we sign up to be parents, it's like you've signed up for a life of guilt. You know, you're, you're never doing enough. You're never doing it good enough. You're, you know, somebody's always upset with you. There's, I think that, um, it is a huge expectation to think that, oh, I have to take care of my mental health and the mental health of my kids. When you think about that, that's overwhelming. And I don't know about you, but I just want to quit now. Like, and, uh, and there were times, actually, to be honest, in our home where I, I was like, I can't. I literally cannot do this. I'm out. Um, and I think I might have told my husband that a couple of times, to be honest. Um, I think that we, we judge ourselves far too, too, um, too much. We are very hard on ourselves. And when I feel shame, I shame others. I don't mean to, but you can only give what you have inside. And if what you have that you're carrying around is shame because you're not doing, you're not doing, should have done that, could have done that. Um, well, all of a sudden it's amazing. You could be the most kind hearted, sweet, loving person, but you will shame other people too, because that's what is, is inside. My son used to always say to me, mom, stop shaming me. I'm like, I just asked you to brush your teeth. That's it. But it was the nonverbals and it was the, it was inside of me 
that, uh, that came bubbling out in the way I was asking him to brush his teeth. And so, yes, huge, uh, huge responsibility, but at the same time, resilience studies say we only have to get this parenting thing right 30% of the time. Okay. That's better than I did in math. No, I'm well, hey, 30%. I mean, that uh, puts us all in the, va in the game, doesn't it, eh? And, and how do you deal with, the, with, and this is a great question, because I've seen a couple of stories, and, and I even talked to one parent a couple of weeks ago who was confronted by someone in a grocery store. And, and you know, it, not surprisingly, it was around COVID, and, and uh, this lady had no one to care for her kids, and so she brought them to get groceries. <laughs> okay, now, hey, I'm a, I'm a father, and if I took my kids to get groceries and somebody came up to me and told me that my kids were going to die because I brought them to get groceries, I probably would, would not respond very well. Unfortunately, that often doesn't happen to men. It often ha I mean, just being honest, it happens more often to women because they're seen as a more vulnerable target, and I think it's terrible. I mean, I think the worst thing you can do, I mean, unless the mom is like throwing them into traffic or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, who are you to judge someone else's parenting? And you have no idea the backstory of why this mom had to bring her kids. I mean, do you think she wanted to bring them? I don't. I mean, I, I shop. I, I'd far rather leave my child at home. It's cheaper. It's a lot less of a hassle, right? You know, I mean, but, but, you know, like, how do you respond to the judgment, you know, and, 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 and why are we judging each other on such a, uh, like, parenting's tough, like, like, who the hell are you to tell someone else how to parent, you know, because it's probably not the easiest thing that somebody could do, right? Oh, it's not. Um, you know, well, women, I can speak for women, you know, we are a catty little bunch. And, uh, you know, we, we're very quick to, to judge one another. It's one of our greatest weaknesses. Hey, ladies. Um, honestly, I think the reason why we judge so easily is because we have created a whole system of the way we do relationships around control, fear, and punishment. That is how we do relationships. Why don't you control your kid? Yeah, control, fear, and punishment. And, uh, and so, you know, you might hear, why don't you control your kids? Well, I don't know uh, if you've ever tried to control your kids, but what happens when you can't, because you'll find out quickly that you can't. And control is a horrible way to do relationships. Um, think about your spouse trying to control you right now. How does, how's that going to go over? It's not going to go over well. So why do we parent that way? Um, this idea that I have to keep my kids under control when I'm in public or it's it's because we've brought been brought up that way people judge that because that's what they think is acceptable fear um when when we can't control something like covid we are looking to control anything like another mother in the grocery store um we're trying to grasp onto something and we often use punishment to do that um punishment could be a statement of judgment uh, it just comes out of us and then afterwards, I don't know if we think about it or not, but it's because we are constantly um, just trying to grasp at having control over something. And right now we are all out of control, which is the best gift to humanity ever, because it calls out how much fear am I actually living in? How much, how much is my parenting fear-based right now? Oh my God, don't go to the grocery store. Like, oh, you know, like we're, we're like, oh no, like, oh no, like. And think about what that does to our kids. We create an environment where there can't be mental wellness because everybody's freaked out. Like we're not doing anyone any favors and then your immunity goes down. So there goes your physical health too. So, and, and, then, we, and then we punish one another. Like we punish other parents, we punish our spouse because they didn't clean up the dishes. So I'm not talking to you for the rest of the night. Yeah. It really calls out the way we do relationships. It's very inhumane, the way we treat one another which brings us back to the only person who can really change and control um, is me. That's it. And, 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 and so, you know, one of the things that's so interesting is we have this sort of way, and I know we don't have a ton of time left, but like when it's almost like when society discovers something like, I don't know that obesity is bad for your health or COVID is a problem or, you know, hey, um, 
you know, we shouldn't do this or we shouldn't do that. We then end up doing this shaming thing, right? Like it's almost like we, we automatically think like fat shaming or, you know, COVID shaming or whatever, like that, as if somehow that's going to fix it. I'm not, um, I'm not a psychologist. I, have, I was a therapeutic counselor for a number of years, but I have yet to see shame create a long-term sustainable solution in someone. I have yet to see shame, you know, cause the light bulb to go on in somebody where from the heart they become a new person. You know, how do, how do we minimize the shame, uh, you know, in our society and, and yet maximize the support? Because I just think, you know, we, we, we got to get away from this shame thing. I, I just, it's just hurting people, right? I think one of the greatest things is that human beings are not, they're not tools and strategies and we don't connect based on our knowledge. We, we connect based on emotion. And so nobody cares how much, you know, nobody cares that, you know, everything about COVID. Nobody cares how much knowledge you have on obesity. Nobody cares. Uh, knowledge is nothing. I mean, it, when it comes to human relationships, people, people uh, have relationships based on emotion. And so again, um, just even in my own story with our own son, I, he was suicidal at age eight, um, diagnosed with depression, anxiety, opposition at age six. And uh, we went through a crisis and now we're on the other side, but now we're on the teenage years. So to, to be continued, it's never, you don't ever fix this. You just continue on. But the person who had to change the most in my house was, was me. And I think right now, um, the best thing that we can do when it comes to uh, COVID, any kind of racism, any kind of social issue that we're facing in our world is to make sense of our own story, is to really dig in here. I love that, uh, is it J G K J K Chesterton says, the person, the change that happens in the world starts right here. It starts with me. And I found that. I found that um, inside of me, uh, was a lot of shame and it was coming out onto my kids, but I don't see it when I'm looking at other people, you know, uh, I, when I, when I just look at what my kids are doing, what my husband's doing, when I take a real long look, uh, and reflect inside and look at some of the patterns that I've had in my own life, the, my own anger, my own frustration, my own racism, my own prejudices that come up. Oh dear God, that takes bravery. It takes so much bravery to look at ourselves. And when we can confront ourselves, uh, we all of a sudden rise up with compassion. And, and we can see that, hey, it would be really easy to, to be a person that, that eats their emotions. I get it. I could easily do that. I could easily hurt someone. I could easily cheat on my husband. I could easily do all those things. As soon as I can see myself as someone who could be in those places, I can have compassion for people who are in those places. I instantly thought, uh, not just of, of, of the black lives, and I might get, might get a lot of flack for this, but I also thought um, about the, the policeman who did that. And I think, man, like, I, I hope that someone, I hope that he can find uh, uh, courage to look inside of him. And if he does, and if he comes forward and says, I wish I, I wish I wouldn't have done that, I hope, I hope that our society can find forgiveness, even though what he did was absolutely horrific. But inside of us is that same person. I think that uh, a lot of the veterans of the, the civil rights movement, and particularly you know, the folks who have been active for a while and for them, it's not, you know, sort of just a, a blip on the social media radar, but it, it's, it's sort of like, this is a long-term struggle. They'll tell you that forgiveness is critical. Now, that does not mean that the, the punishment shouldn't still be experienced. I mean, you, you do the, the crime, you, you should kind of do the time, you know, I mean, I think that's in a, in a just society, well, let's have justice, but but I think you're you're talking about something that is so important, and that's this idea that that I can't really heal. I can't if I'm if I'm stuck in the moment, and and if all I'm doing is hanging on, and it's justifiable anger, it's justifiable rage, it's justifiable uh, hurt. Absolutely, there's no uh, lack of of uh, reason for it, and yet I'm actually hurting myself more in the long term. And, uh, and I, I think I'm, I'm with you in that, 
And I, I totally want to see this person experience the full weight of legal consequences for their actions, whatever that looks like. Um, but somehow you, you know, you, you, again, Martin Luther King Jr., you can't uh, fix hate with, with more hate. Hating him back and hating his kind um, is, is not the solution. And, and somehow, um, you know, we need to get beyond um, sort of the, you know, and, 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 and what I thought about, because, you know, I grew up in, a, in an abused environment and for a time, I mean, never did anything like that, but for a time in my life, I was uh, both um, violent and experiencing acts of violence against me. And I don't think that's because I was a bad guy. I think it's because I had some pretty significant physical violence. And, and, and uh, one of the things that um, uh, occurs to me is, is, is what kind of upbringing and programming and abuse would a guy have to have suffered to become that, you know, because that, that's a monster to me. And, and I don't, you know, I, I, for a moment, I saw that police officer as, as a little boy. And I thought, you know, he started out just like me, just like you, you know, just like any of us as a small child. And yet something happened to him. He, he was brought up in a society that rewarded uh, all of this violence. And, 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 uh, and that's, I think, what we have to change, right? Uh, you know, the law will deal with him as an individual, but he'll go to jail or he'll go to, you know, wherever he goes based on punishment. And, and yet we still have this issue. And, and the issue is, is how do we operate in, in love and forgiveness and, and kindness and empathy, you know? So, um, so I guess just as we, as we conclude, one of the, the questions that came up, and I do think it's relevant to this because we are talking about change and transformation and, uh, you know, how do we, how do we change that self-talk? Because, you know, I mean, for a guy like him, you know, this police officer, he had to tell himself a story about, you know, why it was right to do that. He had to justify his actions to himself. On the other hand, there's others who wrestle with guilt and uncertainty and self-judgment and, and they're trapped because they can't seem to get beyond that. Uh, so, so how do we change that sort of internal story that really could be hindering us in whatever way it's manifesting? Well, I really see that as, as threefold. Um, we often just think, I need to just um, write out affirmations and read them to myself every day. Well, that is step one. Absolutely. In fact, I would recommend, you know, when you're making sense of your story, don't just make sense of the trauma, make sense of what your strengths are and who you are as a, as a remarkable human being. Um, I am, I know my three, I am courageous, I'm compassionate and I'm perseverant. Those are my three. And I call them out in myself all the time, but there's, there's a couple of other steps. Um, Step number two, or I would even say probably step number one, is sometimes it needs to be given to you. Um, for me, I, you know, I have a faith in God, and, and God himself, I feel, really put those things inside of me to believe. Um, and, you know, you might not have a faith, and that's okay. I'm certainly not trying to um, push anything on anybody, but, you know, believing in something else, that you are loved, that you belong, that you're adopted, I feel like those create a very good foundation that sometimes we can't do on our own. But then number three, we forget that we need to call it out in one another. We literally need to be responsible to call out the gold in other people. Um, we, need to, we need to affirm and encourage others. I see you. And we don't do that very often. You know, uh, noticing the good things about somebody and just saying, hey, I've really noticed that you show up and you don't give up. What does that do to somebody? And it creates the opportunity for the bar that they've set for themselves to raise. And I think everyone could use a bit of that. And then when they decide, I'm gonna believe that too, it becomes easier for them to believe it. They're not pushing uphill. They're not repeating their affirmations going, oh, I have no idea if I really am this or not. Somebody else called it out. There's something very powerful about that. So I would say faith, ourselves, and others. You put those three together and you will never forget who you are. I just love that. Yeah, faith, ourselves, and others. And, uh, it, you know, it leaves us on a note of hope, you know. Uh, if you're watching this today or tuning in uh, later, you know, because the recording is going to be posted, you know, you can make a difference today, right? I mean, we don't have to wait for the next election. We don't have to do this or do that. We can actually make a difference right now in our home, in our family, in our community. And I think a huge part of that is, you know, like you said, daily affirmations, 
uh, finding an anchor of faith, whatever that looks like for you. And, uh, and then, you know, calling out the golden people around you, you know, it's, it's, it's actually amazing that all around us, there's so many uh, positive things. And so Connie, just any, any final thoughts here today? I mean, we've talked about so many things and thanks for your open and generous heart. Uh, but uh, you know, what, what are your final thoughts as we wrap this up today? Well, I would love to just speak over everyone a mantra that I wrote um, actually before COVID. And I live this out in my daily life for my mental health. And it's also something that we do with parents. But it says, I am brave. I show up when it's hard. I love without walls. I forgive when it hurts. I rise through the storm. Can you read that one more time? Sure thing. I am brave. I show up when it's hard. I love without walls. I forgive when it hurts. I rise through the storm. I just love that. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, folks, um, we're just uh, going to wrap this up right now. Um, you know, Connie, thanks for having such an open heart and lots of positive comments there. And we'll be posting this uh, uh, recording for sure. Uh, and so make sure you share it and get the word out. And, and you know, uh, there is absolutely in the midst of this tremendous health crisis right now, uh, tremendous mental health crisis, I think, um, that we're experiencing. Uh, but there is still opportunity. And I don't mean that in a crass, you know, oh, let's go sell more iPhones. I'm just talking about an opportunity to make a difference, an opportunity to give back, and an opportunity to thrive, you know, not, not, not just to hang on and hope that all of this passes and then we'll come out of our cave, but to actually continue to thrive, uh, not just in your personal life, but also in your business. And so, you know, I've made this call many times, and so many of you have taken us up on it, uh, but I would encourage you, you know, to, to book a support call if you're interested in, in uh, talking about what that could look like, you know. Uh, you don't have to stay the way you are. You know, you can change, and that's, you know, that old saying where I think, uh, I want to change, not because I'm trying to impress anyone, because I'm not competing with anyone, but I want to be the best version of myself that I can be. And the truth of the matter is I haven't yet done everything with my life that I could be doing. And, uh, and so, you know, I encourage you to, to just reach out and, and book a support call. We have, uh, you know, so many options. And, uh, you know, if you want to reach out, uh, you know, to me, in order to get a hold of Connie, that's fine too, if you don't know how to reach her. And we'd love to support you and love to help you. And next week, uh, we're gonna be here uh, right at 1145 again. Uh, that's on June the 11th. And uh, we've got a fabulous entrepreneur who's gonna be joining us. His name is Steven Stoshak. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He also is the owner of Smoke Confusion, uh, which is an international smokehouse here in Calgary. So he runs a restaurant. Uh, he also runs a print company and he's kind of a serial entrepreneur. And so he has been going, 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 he's doing great things. And, uh, and so if you're looking to hear from uh, a business owner who's had to experience and face some adversity, but who's gotten through it, please do join us uh, next week. That's Thursday. You can go to businessresilience.com and uh, at businessresiliencenow.com and you can register for that. And uh, thank you so much again, Connie. It's been great. And uh, we'll, check in with you. Uh, I'm sure Connie will be seeing lots of you anyways over Zoom. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, one uh, final word to the audience, Connie. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Remember, you're wired to do hard things. You have what it takes to make it. Absolutely. Love that. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.